Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you who are new here, if you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button and setting your notification bell to all so you get reminded of every time I upload a video. If you are interested in becoming a member of the channel, that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. After that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. True story from about 20 years ago or so. I had been living in the Santa Fe Bay Area, but originally from the East Coast and had never been truly camping. My girlfriend at the time was from Cali and was used to camping, so I went with her a few times. This was my first time with her, and her young son of five came with us to Big Sur. It was cool and had been rainy, but this night it was just misty and cold when we arrived. We drove to one of those camp places that has a small parking lot, which was empty except for us. So we set up a tent a little bit away from the car and proceeded to try and get a fire started. And she got mad because she asked me to get things started and I had no idea what to do. Anyhow, so fire started. It was cold and wet and after eating, we all crammed into a two-person tent. Neither of us were gun holders, but I had brought a small knife and a mini baseball bat just in case because I was not really comfortable camping. In the middle of the night, I am guessing because no watch, I was awoken by something walking slowly around the tent. I was so scared that I couldn't figure out if it was two or four-legged. I didn't hear any other sound except what sounded like something trying not to sound too loud, at least in my mind. This went on for what seemed like 10 or 15 minutes, and I was scared shitless, and didn't move but kept my hand on the bat next to me. I remember assuming it was a bear or mountain lion, which I had no experience at all with. Eventually, it sounded like it walked away slowly, but I wasn't really able to get much sleep. At first sunlight, I slowly got out of the tent and sat on a park bench that was near us. After a little time, I see someone walking through the woods towards me, which, again, scared me as we had seen no one since being there. Eventually, I see that it is a ranger or police officer, I don't remember which, and he seems to have his hand on or near his holster. I am wearing camo pants, have a beard, and look pretty scruffy, and I am a bit worried because I have some weed on me and the knife and bat. He asked me my name, what I am doing there, and I explained that I am with my girlfriend and son who are still in the tent. After checking my ID and seeing them, he told us that there had been reports of a crazy guy going around and attacking campers in the area, and to be careful and think about leaving the area soon, which we did because the weather sucked anyway. As it had been raining, there were no prints or other signs of what was walking around us, but it was scary for me, a city guy, not knowing if it was an animal or crazy man, and I was super hesitant to go camping for a bit after that. I'm a local to the South Jersey area, pine barrens and all. I hunt, I fish on the regular, and my house is in the woods. I'm used to the sounds and things that regularly happen around New Jersey. I've had two experiences that I could never grasp an explanation for, and since gave me chills. First one, it was a cold six-day firearm season, and it was opening day. 
I set my stand up in a new spot a little bit further than my previous year. I'm following my bright eyes, aka reflectors, to get to my stand, and it's pitch black and cold. And I do mean negative four with the wind. Not common in New Jersey, so it's already eerie as I'm walking through the pines. I get about 25 yards from my tree. I stop, light a cigarette before I go up. As I'm standing there, a mile deep into the pine barrens, alone in the dark, I hear a grunt. Not a deer grunt. I'm saying full-blown snarl. It stops and goes on for a minute or two. At this point, my shotgun is stacked to the rim. Three rounds. And I'm looking towards the noise. It charges me, gets about ten yards out, and I shot once, hitting to the left of it. This sent it off into the darkness. So I figured, get in your tree now. So I booked it. I'd say ten yards away from my tree, and I get charged again, this time from the back, thrusting me to the ground, and I went face down in delusion. Whatever it was hit me and kept going. I stayed in my tree until 10 a.m. when it was bright out. My only description of what that thing could be would be a hog mixed with a goat. It was freaking terrifying. By the way, we don't have wild boar. Now second, I fish the Great Egg Harbor River regularly, especially stripper fishing, which just so happens to land in the fall, which is cold. I walk a trail that used to go to an old shipbuilder manufacturer on the river. I fish the old structure. Bass love structure. However, there is still a remaining building that is standing. Not bad until you go in. So, one day, me and a friend of mine are going to catch the outgoing tide. We loaded the truck, drove to the trail, and hiked it about a mile. We get down and set up. Nice nor'easter off the coast, so the conditions are perfect. However, about an hour into some good fishing, the rain came. And if you live in the Northeast, you know a nor'easter. When it rains, it pours. So we packed our stuff and headed for the building. Once inside, we set our stuff down and figured, to hell with it, let's chill for a bit and explore the rooms. Bad idea in a nor'easter. Shit gets creepy. So, we walk up to the second floor where there was a line of rooms on the right and a balcony on the left, looking over the bridge. As we approached the first door, my friend felt a bit messed up, like he didn't want to go anywhere and immediately turned around with a big nope. I like exploring stuff, though, so I kept on. I checked the first room. Nothing spectacular. Kept walking, checking the room one by one. And I get to the second to last one and get this weird sensation in my body. Almost like I received the worst news of my life. I broke down. I mean literally broke down to hell. Once I got it together, I boogied down the stairs where I found my friend had left and headed for the truck already leaving all of his fishing stuff there. So, I grabbed up everything and ran out, but had to run back to grab my rod holder that I was using as bum defense. As I looked up at the second story second window from the end, I saw a child standing in the window. The scariest shit I've ever encountered. I'll never go fishing there again. My friends and I used to hike and camp up by the French River in northern Ontario. For anyone unfamiliar with this area, it is extremely remote. You have to leave your car, canoe a few hours, then carry your canoe to your campsite. On the occasion, we were camping for ten days. There were four of us, and we didn't see another person or any sign of anyone near us. On day three, we decided to wake up early and hike along the river, going north. 
One of my friends was really good with maps and planning hikes for us, and he said that this one is about a nine-hour hike, there and back to our campsite. We started our hike at 6 a.m., and at around noon, stopped to swim for a bit in the river to cool off followed by some lunch that we had packed and a beer or two each. We started packing up again and noticed a small cabin off in the distance about 25 meters downstream. We knew we would come back the same direction, and we put our garbage in a bag with our beer cans and hoisted it up over a tree. This is a common thing to do while camping, as it keeps wildlife such as bears away from getting into your garbage. We knew we would be back the same way in a few hours to collect our garbage to bring back to the main campsite. For the remainder of the hike, I couldn't help but feel like someone was watching us, but there was no other signs of people around us. When we reached the end point, nearly exhausted, but also satisfied with how far we had come, we debated stopping again for a rest before making the six-hour walk back to our main campsite. As we discussed, I mentioned that I kind of just want to get back to our campsite because I can't shake the feeling like we are being watched. Two of my friends there also admitted that they had the very similar feeling, so we decided to head back. As we approached the area where we rested and swam earlier, we came across our garbage bag. It had been removed from the tree and emptied. The weird thing was that it wasn't ripped open or torn, as you might expect from an animal. Instead, it was untied and neatly emptied and left wide open on the ground. We remembered the old cabin downstream, but there was no sign of it this time. As we walked a little further, we saw something on top of a rock. It was our beer cans. We consumed two each, so there were eight empty beer cans. Only, they weren't just scattered on the rock, as you might expect from an animal. They were neatly piled in a pyramid-type shape. As we got closer, we noticed a Polaroid photo tucked under the bottom one. It was a photo of the four of us, swimming, completely freaked out at this point. We half ran, half walked back to our campsite. We arrived at dusk and decided that this night would be the last night of our originally planned 10-day camping trip. None of us slept a wink that night. We stayed up by the fire, terrified and hoping for morning to come. By sunrise, we packed up and hiked out with our canoes. We were so happy to see our vehicles where we left it and drove home together in deafening silence. Hey guys, I've been wanting to share my story for a while now, but I just now found the time to sit down and write it. I'm a 21-year-old guy. This happened to me back when I was in high school, about five years ago. It was my senior year. Classes were winding down and teachers were finding lust to talk about as we were so excited to just get out of there. This one teacher I had was super quirky, kind of weird, but cool to me as he always had interesting experiences to share. He and my group of friends in the class became acquainted among the other students who wouldn't listen to him when he attempted to speak about his past shenanigans. One day, he brought up this oasis, as he called it, a place in the woods he would visit when he was young. It was a clearing deep within the trees, complete with dunes and a small beach not too far where we were going to school. We, of course, didn't believe him, so he showed us on Google Maps. Our naive selves thought that after school, we would attempt to reach the space, entering from a backyard closest to the clearing. We should have known that 40-something years later, the layout of the place would have changed. Come the end of the day, I gather up three of my closest friends, we all agree on the plan of using Google Maps as our GPS. After convincing one of our moms to drop us off, 
with the lie of hanging out at a friend's place, we made our way to the edge of the forest. God, I wish we called it quit then. We started out all right, I guess, making our way closer by climbing through hordes of bushes and weeds. It was probably the most run-down, gross, dumped-on parts of the forest with broken car parts and trash everywhere. Eventually, as we got closer to the supposed clearing, we hear a dog viciously barking in the distance. My alarms went off. What was the dog doing in the middle of the damn woods? It was fairly residential, so no hunting, but also no trails or any reason to be out there. My friends were a mix of angry at me for suggesting this and extremely anxious about how we were going to get through it. At this point, we just wanted to make it to the sandy beach part of the woods, which seemed so close judging by our distance on the maps. The closer we got, the louder the barking became. At this point, we weren't saying much to each other as I led. We were literally up Shit's Creek with nowhere to go. The barking seemed like it was coming from everywhere. I could see a dirt clearing ahead, so I just told everybody to make a break for it. At least in the open, we could see what was coming at us. This was not the clearing we were hoping for and one I could not find on the map when I tried to look for it later. Off in the distance was a medium-sized makeshift building. It appeared to be made of plywood painted gray and black. Above the door hung a giant animal skull with horns. I felt a pit in my stomach because I immediately knew this was the source of the barking, being as it was, as its loudest. After managing to snap a pick, I stood there frozen, unsure of what to do next. I came back to my senses when I heard a deep and angry voice shout, Hey, what the hell are you doing? From somewhere close by the building. I'd officially had enough of the situation. I'd gotten all my friends into this mess, so I felt responsible for their safety. I told everybody we're just going to have to bite the bullet and run blind through the woods. It could have been my mind playing tricks, but I swear it felt like that dog was chasing us. Almost like somebody let it loose. After kicking through so much dense wilderness and trees, we were so scraped up and bloody by the time we got far enough away that we felt safe. Huddled together and practically crying, I called my mother and told her the mess we were in. I gave her the street closest to the side of the woods we were on and she gladly came and picked us up. She said when she saw us on the side of the road, it looked like we had been through hell and back. After that day, we barely spoke about it. We didn't even tell the teacher who started the whole damn thing in fear of somehow getting him in trouble. So... To the creeper with the skull hut in the middle of the forest, let's not ever freaking meet. Finally, it's time to begin. The bear is ready. It starts trying to open the door. The door only has a wire and two nails holding it shut. Skookum hardware, to be sure, but nonetheless wanting. It's dark inside the shack, so every time the bear finds an edge to grip onto with its teeth and ties to pull the door open, the wood flexes and lets in a flash of white morning light around the door frame. I'll never forget that. It pulling a few times, losing its grip, getting a better grip, then pulling again. Flash, flash. Flash, pause, flash, 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 flash. Trying to open the door and get to us, our food, or whatever. Dad is up by now, of course, miffed about, missing all the evening excitement, but ready to take care of this. We have a quick exchange between the three of us in which we all quickly agree with great resignation and disappointment 
that we need to take this animal's life. We had never killed a bear. We never wanted to. We love bears. They're such beautiful and powerful animals. To see a big, healthy bear, all fat with a shiny coat, roaming its natural habitat, it's a sign that the entire ecosystem and food chain leading up to it are healthy. They're a symbol of a healthy ecosystem and a truly incredible piece of nature. But this one has been ruined. It's been fed. There's no curing this. There's no fixing it. And there's no leaving this cabin with that thing at our door. I stand at one tiny plexiglass window, uncle at the other, and dad stands at the door with his rifle loaded and ready. There's no tin on the door, so he considers shooting right through it. The bear hears him and has dropped back to all fours and is sniffing the base of the door now. I'm helping Dad line up the shot to its head. Suddenly, it swings its head up and walks the few feet over to my window. It stands and I find myself staring face to face with a big, fat, black bear with small brown eyes with very small pupils staring straight back at me inches away with nothing but plexi between us. I'm staring into this thing's eyes and I'm imagining this all going wrong. It hurting me and devastating my mother. It hurting my dad and devastating me. And for the first time in my life, I feel the flight response for my flight, fight, or freeze mode. I feel rage. The audacity of this animal to not screw off when we hold it to. How dare you? How freaking dare you? I bare my teeth in a snarl, jerk towards it suddenly, screaming at it and slamming my hands against the window frame to make one big jarring motion and noise. It didn't even flinch. Not even a blink. Just stared back, deadpan. Yeah, the guy is broken. He drops back down and sniffs the door, sniffs around where he left scraps the day before that we had cleaned up, moving a foot away, a few more feet, just over by the wood pile. Now. My dad steps out onto the porch in all his glory, wearing nothing but his boxers, his boots, and his glasses. He raises the rifle and shoots, hitting what must have been the lungs. The bear drops. Immediately, it tries to stand again. It manages to stand its back legs up, but the front of his body and his face are still laying on the ground, and it's trying to drag itself upwards. Second shot. Down. Use a wide circle to get in close, behind the head and away from the paws. Final shot into the back of the skull. We tag it then sit down for a bit to make some coffee to process the events before processing the bear. We will have to take the skull and full hide for the COs to check over, but we don't eat bear due to the parasites. It's legal to leave the body, and we kind of have to, but it feels horrible, wasteful and dirty. Like we were taking trophies off this thing that should never have ended up like this. I can't remember if I had any tears over it that day, but I certainly felt like it, and probably did later on once the adrenaline had worn off. The whole thing was just so sad and unavoidable. Dad and Uncle and I all talked about how this was all due to human activity in the first place, trying to reassure ourselves that we can't be held responsible for the action of others. We can only try to be as responsible for ourselves as we can. We ended up dragging the bear back a few hundred feet behind the shack. We won't be staying there for more than two days, and wolves are known to frequent that area, so we felt confident that we'd be off everyone's menu until it was time to break camp. Wolves defending an easy meal means free security in the area, and as long as we don't bother each other, we're happy to just keep a few hundred feet of trees between us. The rest of the trip goes fine. We get our moose, uneventful aside that. 
a CO camping the boat launch, comes to check our tag so we tell him the entire story about the bear. Having a tag negates the need for that, but considering the circumstances and our own sense of shame in our involvement, we wanted to make sure we got everything into the open. They need to track stuff like problem bears and the human behavior that creates them and test the skull for various diseases to ensure the behavior issue isn't due to something else that may be affecting the population. They reassured us that we did everything right in the shitty circumstances we found ourselves in, let us know where to turn in the hide and skull, and even return the hide to us later. We had it tanned. We weren't sure how to treasure what was left of that bear and we wanted to keep the memory of the risks, the dangers, and the responsibilities we faced when we were out there. But, damn, that behavior, total confidence around humans like that, is just so unnatural. It almost didn't feel like a real bear, but not in a maybe, it's rabid way. Just a, it knows, it knows, I can't do shit kind of way. I'll never ever forget the day that I cheated death by looking a wild bear directly in the face. It was a Sunday, early in the morning. I live in the suburbs, but my parents own a farm that I enjoy going to because I get to see my dog. Her name is Molly. She's a mutt but she's not a tiny dog by any means. At that time, I felt very safe around her and would often take her for walks in a forest that was nearby. The day started off like any other. Me and my dad got in the car, drove around for a while, and arrived at the farm. I immediately got out of the car and hugged Molly. My parents always got angry when I hugged her, since I'd smell like her for the rest of the day. I put her leash on and asked my dad if I could take her for a walk. He always thought that we would just go down a road and back, but I always found it more interesting to take her to the forest. I always felt a certain kind of peace and relaxation there that was unmatched by anything else. So, we took a turn and headed to the forest. Usually, when we got there, I'd take her off the leash, so she could explore on her own. Most of the time, I'd carve my name into the trees or look for anything interesting. I was playing baseball with some rocks and a wooden leg, presumably from an old table. And then, I heard it. Molly was barking at something. This was unusual when we were in the forest. I thought it was a fox or some other animal, so I quickly grabbed the wooden leg like a weapon. I knew that if it was a fox, I wouldn't attack it, but I had a sense of security while I was holding it. I called out, Molly, Molly, but she just kept on barking. This was very strange for me since she always came to me when I called her. I followed the round of her barks and stumbled across a scene I'll never forget. There was a man probably in his late fifties, half naked, carrying a large machete in one hand and holding moonshine in the other. This was the first time that I had stumbled across someone in the woods, let alone someone half naked and carrying a big ass machete. He was completely ignoring Molly and hacking away at the ground for some reason. I didn't really know how to handle the situation. Even now, I have no idea how I would have handled it. Uh, sir, are, are you okay? I ask in confusion. I don't think I understood the seriousness of the situation at the time. He turned around, revealing his face. He had some of the clearest blue eyes I have ever seen to this day. I could see them so well because they were wide open. Come here, boy. Look what I dug up. I was afraid that if I didn't listen to him, he would start chasing after me 
and that was something I wanted to avoid at all costs. I got closer, but kept a good distance. I didn't see anything except for an empty hole. He turned to hitting the ground with his machete, occasionally taking sips from that bottle. I used this window of time to get my dog and started walking away slowly, as to not notify him that I was leaving. But then, I took one final glance at the man. His head was dug deep in the hole. I was intrigued, so I kept thinking. I know, how stupid of me. He finally got up from the ground. I was shocked when I saw him carrying a bone in his mouth. I have no idea what animal it belonged to, if it even did belong to an animal. I had seen enough and started sprinting with my dog. As we ran, I heard him laughing, and then I saw something flying from the corner of my eye. It was that damn machete. I heard him yell, Damn it! This time, I ran faster. I know the forest very well, so I wasn't afraid of getting lost. I ripped through branches and bushes until I got out of the forest. But I didn't stop sprinting until I arrived at the garage, where my father was testing out lights on our tractor. I didn't tell him a single thing about the man, since I was afraid that he'd get angry and wouldn't allow me to walk Molly anymore. Needless to say, I never went back to that forest alone ever again. Man with a machete and bone in his mouth. I hope I don't run into you again. This happened in the early 2000s, and I was probably in first grade or a year younger, and this was in Bulgaria. I am from a mid-sized town, not too small and not too big. The perfect one for raising your children. Crime is pretty much unheard of. You can sleep outside on a bench and nothing would happen to you. One weekend, some family friends from a nearby town came to my town to visit, and my parents and I decided to go to the park with them. Now, it is important to say that all of the parks in my town are located right on the edge of town, so they are actually parks or forests at some point. The park becomes a forest. Since it is not a very big town, we don't have central parks. And the park that we went to runs along a river, so it is a very narrow alley, but a very long one. And on one side, there is a river, and on the other, there is a thick forest and the cliffs. At that time, I didn't like that park so much because it was a very long walk. And you had to walk a lot to get to the end of it. So... Like most kids, I got bored of walking with my parents and the other family since they were talking grown-up stuff and I didn't want to listen to them. I decided to run off ahead, and by ahead, I mean out of sight from my parents. Keep in mind that this is a one-alley park, which you walk only straight forward, with slight curves due to the river, so I had gone pretty far. Usually, in this park, there are always people, and it is quite crowded on the weekends, but since it was summer, most people were on family vacations, and it was surprisingly empty, and I couldn't see anyone in a straight line, in either way. At that point, I started hearing something in the forest, which was pretty loud, since on the other side was the river, and it was loud itself. I stopped and stared at the forest, and I saw how the bushes were moving and coming in my direction. I was still pretty clueless to what was happening until I saw a freaking man with long hair, a band across his forehead, dressed like a hunter with an air rifle on his back, running full speed towards me. There was no freezing moment, I just started running in the opposite direction and screaming my lungs out for my parents, hoping that they would hear me. But, because of the river, I doubt that anyone could have heard me from a hundred meters away. I remember looking backward and seeing him still chasing me, and I was thinking, okay, maybe this is the end. It's over, 
and I was imagining how he would catch me and drag me into the forest and I would never see my family and friends again. It felt like an eternity, but I finally saw my parents and our family friends. My whole face was red. I was crying and snotting like crazy, barely breathing. The hunter also stopped running after he saw my parents and the others. I remember my parents started screaming at him, like, what the hell was he doing? I don't remember what he actually said. I just realized that it was over, but I remember him shaking his head, like saying, I did nothing wrong. I was only trying to help him. The weirdest part was that there is no game in that park. It is a park after all, and the forest that he was hiding in, max of 50 meters and width before the cliffs again, so it was impossible to have any game there since there are always people walking. You can see wild foxes and that's about it. You need to go beyond the park out in the forest to hunt game. Also, it is also highly illegal to carry a firearm out in public. We have very strict laws on firearms. Only police and military personnel are allowed to carry firearms. I don't know anyone who owns a gun. Civilians are allowed to register only air guns for hunting. No hardcore weapons allowed. And of course, you are not allowed to carry them in a park where there are people. Only in regulated zones for hunting game away from populated zones. You would never see hunters like that unless you go into those zones, or you are in a village, which is still rare. No, we didn't report it afterward. Too much of a hassle, really. This was the first time and last time something like that has happened to me ever, thankfully. And I haven't developed fear from that place. Even now, when I go back to my town, I go running in that park after midnight, and I am perfectly fine. So, to the crazy hunter in the park, who was only trying to help, I hope I never see you in that park ever again. Okay, so this happened to me earlier, and I don't think I'll be sleeping tonight. I'm currently staying in a remote part of the United Kingdom and having a break from working, which means more time to pursue my hobbies, one being photography. I had scraped out a creepy looking tree formation in a nearby forest and set my camera and tripod up as the sun was coming down, you know, for the extra creepy vibe. As I'm happily taking photos, I see a woman pass the entrance to the arched trees. This woman had parked her car next to mine when I arrived. She went past a couple of times, looking at me, for prolonged periods with each time she passed. I assume she wants to come up this path, but sees that I am taking photos, so decides to walk elsewhere. Approximately five minutes go by and she appears again, this time walking towards me, dragging her left side slightly with the strange limp. She stops once and stares at me for a few seconds, then starts walking towards me again. I ask her if she is okay. I'm starting to put my camera away at this point and readying my tripod to use for self-defense if necessary because the vibe I'm getting is way off. And she starts grunting at me, then stops and stares again. It's at this point that this woman is close enough for me to realize that she's actually a man in a woman's clothing, with the wig on, might I add. An uncomfortable moment passes and she starts grunting again, walking towards the edge of the path, grabs a pile of leaves and starts throwing them around, grunts some more, and then walks off aimlessly into the forest. I call my friend to tell her what has happened and ask that she stays on the phone in case the person comes back. I'll just take a couple more photos and then I am out. For a good ten minutes, I hear the crunching of leaves circling me in the forest, and I just convince myself that it's the wildlife. Then, silence. I take the photos and I haven't seen or heard the person 
for about 15 minutes now, so I assume I'm safe. I leave the path and I see that the car has gone. Thank God. However, I very quickly notice that there is a man walking towards me from the entrance. It's the same damn guy. He has changed into men's attire, and as he walks past me, he shoots me a grin that sends shivers down my spine. I don't scare easily, but this guy just gave off the wrong signals, causing the overwhelming feeling of dread to wash over me. I'm still on the phone at this point and holding my tripod over my shoulder, just in case. I quickened my pace and got back into my car. As I did so, I saw him come out of the lane I had been down, stop and look around, then start walking towards my car with intent. This part is all on video. I record him for a while and then haul the hell out of there, driving past his car that he had moved down the road and thinking, what in the gray beard hell just happened? Lumping, leaf throwing, for stalker, I hope I don't meet you ever again. Oh, quick note. I did report this to the non-emergency police number just because it was so freaking weird and I absolutely got the whole this guy could hurt someone feeling as I walked past him. My husband and I are amateur mushroom hunters. Three seasons out of the year, we spend weekends in forests, along nature trails and rivers looking for edible and interesting wild mushrooms to harvest. Springtime brings the most exciting hunt, which is the highly coveted morels. We know of a special stretch of shoreline along a river that has a few dozen morels each year. It's difficult to get to as it's off the proper path and you have to do a bit of ducking, climbing, and maneuvering to get through. One day, two years ago, we were doing just that, making our way slowly and searching carefully for the mushrooms hiding in plain sight. We were so preoccupied with our task that we don't know how long we were being watched or followed. But at one point, we saw a man up ahead of us, looking at us, and not saying anything or moving almost like he was waiting to be noticed. My husband saw him first and turned to shoot me a look because we never encountered anyone in that spot before. It was beside a small and fairly busy park, but people didn't stray from the paved walk path much. There was a weird energy about the man that can best be described as vaguely menacing. We were near the end of where we wanted to look anyway, so we turned around and started working our way back. When we looked behind us a few minutes later, the man was gone. We wrote it off as just some weirdo, maybe a homeless guy whose territory we had wandered into. We had continued looking over the spots we had already covered in case we missed any morales. Me in front and my husband right behind me, looking back every few paces as we were feeling more paranoid as we went. All of a sudden, I look up from the ground at my feet, and the man is blocking our path up ahead, maybe 30 feet. He had to have left the riverbank and crept up alongside us on the path, getting ahead of us in order to cut us off at the pass like that. I whip around with huge eyes at my husband, who looks over my shoulder, sees him, and starts to move up the hill on our right. River was on the left, grabbing my hand to pull me with him. Adrenaline shot us out of the thick brush and onto the paved path, into the open park moments later. Without speaking, we broke into a sprint toward the direction of our car, several blocks away. Road construction prevented closer parking. When we were far enough away from the river bank to risk a backward glance, we saw the man emerge from the brush. He just stood there, watching us leave, motionless. We speculated the entire ride home what he wanted from us, knowing it was nothing innocent. To this day, it still bothers me, and I wonder what would have happened if we had spread apart further while we hunted, or if either of us 
had been alone. To the man who blocked our path that day, I hope we never run into each other ever again. This happened almost two years ago. I had decided to go biking with my son, eight months old at the time, and my dog, Henry, Irish bloodhound, Rottweiler mix. My husband was going fishing with a mutual friend at a state park nearby. I decided to go hike one of the more remote trails in a different part of the park and meet him later. I drove to a wooded area about 10 minutes from where my husband was fishing. It was an early spring day, still chilly but tolerable with the sun shining. I parked the car and got my son ready. He was smiling and laughing. I would wear him in a forward-facing hiking sling in the front of me at the time. Henry was sniffing around and whining excitedly, as if to say, hurry up, let's go. We started off on the hike and it was a really beautiful, peaceful trail. Towering trees mixed with pine, a crystal clear creek wove its way through the trail at points. We would periodically stop and play, all three of us that is. About an hour and a half into the hike, we had gone two and a half or three miles and rounded a narrow bend in the trail when we nearly collided with a gentleman in his late forties, maybe early fifties. Henry was snarling and lunging toward the man before I even completely registered what was going on. I quickly backed up and pulled Henry back the best I could. I had goosebumps at this point. Henry would not calm down. This was very unusual behavior for him, but not if he was trying to protect us. Trying to talk over Henry, I loudly said, I'm sorry, Henry is just very protective of my son. If you move off to the side, we can pass you. My son was very quiet during this entire exchange, which I found a bit odd. The guy was staring very intently at my son. He then laughed slightly and said, <laughs> Oh, he should be. It's a good thing he's with you. Then he motioned to something around his neck and said, I am just out here taking some pictures. It's a hobby of mine. Except... He wasn't wearing any kind of camera around his neck or anywhere that I could see. He had a canteen around his neck. I politely asked him again to step aside so that we could pass. At this point, Henry was sitting down but growling still. Henry would not take his eye off the guy. I have no doubt that Henry would have eviscerated this man if he had tried anything. And I am positive this guy felt that. The guy looked at Henry for a few seconds, then at my son. He took a few steps off the trail so there was room to get by and so that Henry couldn't reach him when we went by. As I warily walked by him, he was like 10 feet to my left at this point. He muttered something about how he used to be able to see the kids. I kept looking back as we walked away to make sure he wasn't turning around to walk our way. He did continue to stare at us for several minutes, though, until I could no longer see him. We went hiking and eventually came to an opening point where cars could park. There was no one there, and luckily, I still had cell phone reception. I called my husband. He and his friend came to pick us up right away, and they took us back to my car. There was no sign of the guy we encountered. We went home after that. Henry has since passed away, and I am so sad that my son doesn't get to grow up with him. He really was the best dog ever. I know everyone says that about their dog, but he really was. So, thanks Harry for being gentle yet fierce. He once went head to head with a Florida panther and a bear. Two different occasions when we lived in the Everglades, but there are separate stories together. And to the photographer in the woods, never again. Hi.
Hello there. English is not my first language, so please be kind. So, my story takes place when I was about 13 years old. I'm 19 now, if the details are unclear. I'm very sorry. I just moved into a small countryside town in a house that was just beside a huge forest. It was a new neighborhood and didn't really have much houses on the street. You could, without a doubt, walk hours into the woods and still be going. Being young and stupid, I'd take my dog for a walk without having my parents with me or anything to protect me. I don't even remember having a cell phone on me, to be honest. Don't blame my parents, please. They were reassured by the fact that my dog was really big and people were easily frightened by him. Like, really easily scared. My dog was about seven, detail that has its importance. I did that often. Nothing bad ever happened and I never met any people. I loved it because I could really take my mind off everything else that was happening in my life. The moving was rough on me and to make everything more fun, I was being bullied at school. Woo hoo. So I really needed that. So there I was casually walking on a track that is across the wood that is used if you have a motocross or a quad. A noise that I didn't take too much attention at first was coming from behind me, started to become louder. When I turned back, I could see a person coming straight at me on his motorcycle. I'm a 13-year-old girl who was scared of about everything that seemed out of the ordinary. So, I decided to get off of the track as quickly as I could hide. Unfortunately for me, Henry is black and does not blend with the surroundings, as everything else was green, and it was in the middle of the day. I walked pretty fast, but I can tell that the bike was closer, and I was pretty obvious. I started running and found a rock that was big enough to hide, me and my dog behind. I heard the moto cross come and go. It was impossible for the person to see us, really. I waited, telling myself that I was being silly. When I thought I waited long enough, I started walking again. I froze instantly when I heard the loud engine becoming suddenly close to me again. Without hesitation, I started running like hell, and when I was able to stop and hide, I did. My dog wasn't in the best shape and I was feeling so bad for making him run that much. I could tell he was getting closer and closer to me. It wasn't a very dense forest, so he could have followed me. He was so much faster than me. I'm a clumsy person. I trip on about everything I can, so when I did meet this lovely branch, I fell on the ground pretty hard after tripping on it. But I think I was so full of adrenaline that I just got up and started running again. He was meters away from me, so he can see me, and he is clearly chasing me. There was no doubt in my mind that if he gets me, something really bad could happen to me. We were approaching a more dense part of the forest, so the guy had no choice but to stop. It did give me the advantage over him, and I was able to get away from him. I was so glad when I saw a house. It was under construction, so nobody lived in it. I did find a hiding spot behind this fence. Minutes later, I saw the person come so close to me yet again. I could tell he didn't see where I went. I felt this huge relief when he started to go away. I think I hid for about 30 to 40 minutes without moving to make sure he did not come back. I did find my way home and told my parents about it, but they thought I was being dramatic. At the end, I never knew who this person was. I did hurt myself, but nothing too serious. I heard, years later, about weed that was being grown in that part of the woods and cameras. Maybe I came too close to something and they saw me on the cameras. I also went with friends of mine when I was older and found out a small abandoned house that was not too far from where this happened was located in that same part of the woods.
Alrighty, dear listeners, that brings a close to these true, backwards, creepy stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes, and I would also like to give credit to the gifted memberships. Donna, Nat Davies, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Chrissy Elias, Denise S., Tina Me, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klimko, Haunted, and Anita B. I can't say it enough. Thank you so much for being the pillars on which Back to Ashes stands. I deeply appreciate each and every last one of you. And now our gifted memberships. The Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Gregg, and Encrypted Sleeps. Thank you so much for your active support. I really do appreciate it. To all the subscribers or random listeners, thank you as well for your support. For without you, I would not have a voice. With that being said, if you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.